Well, welcome to Karis Relationship University. So I want to thank you so much for those of you students who came on campus, but we also want to welcome in and thank our live stream audience for joining us today. So Relationship University is the goal to train you in God's best and His way of doing relationships. One, for your personal lives, but two, also in helping other people walk healthy relationships with the Lord, with those around them. Um, at Relationship University, we discuss a variety of topics topics with a variety of teachers from singleness to marriage to friendships to workplace colleagues. Uh, it's just a great opportunity to grow and learn and how to have healthy relationships as the body of Christ. Amen. Well, I want to share with you as well that this last year we created Relationship University for Karis. And so I encourage especially those of you on campus that you're here, but also those of you online, you can check this out on our website, but there's over 56 hours of curriculum training. There's there's books that come with it, videos. I'll tell you, it's powerful time with not just teaching, but also testimonies of people who've walked this out and what God's done in their lives. Also, for those of you who are joining us, if you're unaware, all of our Relationship University classes we do on Mondays um, here in Colorado are also recorded on our archives, and you can check that out at awmi.net forward slash relationships. And so without further ado, I'm excited to introduce to you our speaker today. So she is the Assistant Vice President of Andrew Womack Ministries International and Karis Bible College. So please welcome with me, Miss Carrie Pickett. Amen. All right. Thank you. A few but mighty. Well, I'm really excited as well. I know a welcome live stream audience. I know that you've uh, seen Mike and I do different things with the archives and um, we're trying to <clears throat> get before the student body at different times. And so I have um, some things that I want to share with you guys today. And I just believe that um, this is a, a word in due season. You know, um, a little bit just as far as my passion for teaching on relationships is because, um, you know, as a single person and then as I got married and now as a mom and all those dynamics, there's just seasons of relationship. There's different seasons we go through. And we say this at Karis Bible College a lot, you know, it's, it's, it's single, single again, married, married again. And so um, there's, there's dynamics that even it's not just singleness and marriage, sometimes it's again. You know, and so then how do we go through yet another season, right? And what's so powerful is that, again, in every relationship, we cannot do any relationship well. We cannot without first having a relationship with God that we do well. Amen. You know, I was um, dealing with a situation this last couple of weeks and, and uh, you know, so, uh, someone had got hurt really badly. And I remember saying, you know, the dynamic at the end of the day is that someone can hurt you. Someone can, you know, say negative things and, and there is legit things that people can do to us that can just absolutely just knock the wind out of us sometimes, right? And so, but at the end of the day, nobody can take our relationship with God unless we give it to him. No one can tell us that we are damaged goods, that we have no future, that we don't have a purpose, that we're not good at anything. No one can tell us that unless we give them permission. And so it has to come back down to what kind of authority does my relationship with God have? Especially when it comes to relationships. Because yes, people can be just gnarly and snarly and, you know, just cranky and just high maintenance and dysfunctional and broken and hurt and hurting people hurt people, right? And that goes, that, that goes back to us as well, that if we're hurting, then we can hurt people. And so when we talk about relationships and just what kind of permissions and what kind of authority do we give people in our lives? And I actually plan on going a different direction, but I, I feel like this is also important that we, we address at the beginning here, is that our position where we place somebody, their positional place within our lives, we do need to understand what that positional place is. It's a, it's a spouse, it is a parent, it is a boyfriend, girlfriend, right? What kind of positional authority do we allow them to have within our lives? 
And there are positions. You know, when it says in the Bible, it says, you know, children obey your parents for this is right in the Lord. And it is a promise, right, that contains a long life. And so there is this positional place of submission of children underneath their parents. Now, once the kids get to a certain age and they decide to move out, mom can't be like, oh, no, 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 baby, you live in with me forever. Right? <laughs> That's where I'm at with my daughter. You can't ever grow up and leave mommy. <laughs> and then one day I'll be like, go, 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 go. But there's this dynamic of just positionally, you know, there are, there are positions. You know, it talks about the husband as the head of the home and the husband and wife coming into a covenant relationship. The wife uh, having a position in the marriage, the husband having a position in the marriage, roles and attributes that they each carry. And then when you become parents and then you have this role and responsibility and authority as parents and a certain period in your children's lives. When we're working for an employer, right, there's a position we have as an employee. But in the same way, it goes with the employer also has a position and responsibility and authority. So within all of these things, there are very clear lines and even things that we grew up knowing that there were some positional things. But I've seen the enemy take so much of those things out of context where people then get abused or misunderstanding about the authority they possess or the authority they should submit under to. And when it gets confusing, the only thing that keeps that balance, the only thing that clarifies the boundaries of the people within our lives and our positions in other people's lives is it has to come back to where is the position of God in our lives? Is he the ultimate authority in us? Is he's the ultimate authority of how we interact with people? He's the ultimate one that we submit and surrender to because if he's not, then we will give other people the authority to lead us, guide us, damage us, traumatize us. We actually lend that responsibility, we lend that to them, sometimes just completely handing over the keys and saying, my worth and value is in your hands. And this is what we see within the world today. And, and you know, the vision with Relationship University isn't just the, so that you and I can learn how to do relationships better. That is definitely a goal. But we need to do relationships in such a way that the world says, okay, um, <clears throat> can I talk to you? How do you, how do, you do this? <laughs> how do you not, like, not you know, um, strangle your mate? <laughs> <laughs> not literally, okay. Um, but like, how do you not, like, how do you, how do you have this patience? Like, I see life in you. I see all of these other things. How do you do that, right? And we've got to be able to then bring back to them, not just like, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just good at marriage, I guess. No, there has to be something that we also share. So Relationship University is also about how do we minister healthy relationships to the people around us? Because I'm telling you right now, the world is craving to see something real. They're absolutely craving to see something that is alive and it is working. They're not looking for perfection. I really believe that the world is smart enough. They know there's no perfection. They know there's not perfection. That's why we have Botox and, and plastic surgeons and girdles. I mean, that is why we have those things, right? Because we, everybody knows we're not perfect. And so we have all these other, you know, that's, that's a billion dollar industry of something that, you know, you don't have, but you need. So I think the world's smart enough that they're not looking for perfection, but they're looking for something real. And so when you and I in relationship with God, that is the realest thing that, that we could ever present to them. So that no matter what's going on in our circle of relationships around us, right? Even other people who say, you know what? That's dysfunctional around you. You shouldn't put up with that. And you know, yeah, I shouldn't put up with this. But how do we respond? So the way we place Christ is of the uttermost importance. And if we can do relationship with God, well, then... What happens is then how we interact and how we allow people to interact and intersect with our lives now becomes so healthy because we know what the boundaries are. We know like this is not a healthy boundary. No, that's not how God treats people. And you may say, I have no worth and I have no value and I'm never going to amount to anything and I can never fall into my future. But who are you to tell me what my purpose in God is? 
who are you to say what I'm going to grow up and be when I grow up? Because <laughs> we're all still growing up. <laughs> Amen? No matter what age we are. They're still growing into the destiny that God has for us. And so <laughs> this, this beautiful picture of then how do we submit to the Lord? So I want to talk about a couple different things today as far as not just relationship with God, right? And how that that lays these boundaries, but then their identity and our security within that that then promotes a boldness. A boldness to say, you know what? No, no, no. This is not, this is not how I am going to treat other people and this is not how I'm going to be treated. And you know, people will ask me these questions. They'll say, well, Carrie, how do you, when you have somebody that's abusive, verbally, physically, sexually, um, if you've got people that constantly are degrading you and, and you know, devaluing you, how do you stand up? Well, first you have to stand up in your relationship with God. You have to stand up in that first. Seek him and you will find him when you seek him with all your heart. In Jeremiah chapter 29 and those verses, we always start in verse 11, but 11 through 13, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. And so what happens is we will let people have a vote of harm in our life. Like, hey, well, I vote that you're not able to do it. And their goal is to harm us and to bring us into a, a controlling atmosphere. In this world, I'll tell you right now, there is so much brokenness that is happening. And if you and I are going to be out there helping set the captives free, so much of what they are enslaved by not is, is not just the enemy. Obviously, it's the enemy and it's the lies of the enemy. But the, the way he's encompassed their situation himself about them and the lies about them is in the context of relationships. And that's why you and I learning to do relationships well isn't about learning all kinds of tricks and trades and communication secrets. It's about, Lord, how do I see people? Because the way you see people will be the way you treat them. In the same way, when someone's treating you not right, it's because, it's because of the way they see you. But it's also the way they see themselves, right? Have you ever noticed that somebody will come up to you and accuse you of different things that they're, they're the ones guilty of, right? They'll say, oh, well, you're always like this. And you're like, really? I thought that was you. <laughs> Wait a minute. We talk I'm sorry, I'm confused. Were we talking about me or you in this conversation, right? Because people will take whatever their dysfunction is, whatever their hurt is, and then they'll try to put it back on you. So the way they value you is through the value of their selves. That's why the Bible says, love your brother like yourself doesn't mean we walk around with this big chip on your shoulder and be like, I am awesome. Right? I'm not talking about prideful, like, you know, how you serve and cater and, you know, you make yourself your own God within your own life. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a healthy understanding of you and your relationship with God so you can walk around being like, you know what? I am of value. And I do have a purpose on my life. And God has, has a plan, and it's a plan to prosper me. So that means in every part of your life, you're supposed to prosper. It's in relationships, it's in identity, it's in purpose, it's in health, it's in finances. It's being free from the past so you can live in the prosperity of the future, right? And then all the relationships that he's wanting to bring within you, you have a foundation of then health. And so when we talk about identity in Christ, right, we're getting to that place where you begin to see yourself the way God sees you. See, so many times identity in Christ, people misconstrue it and think, well, identity in Christ is just me making a whole bunch of confessions. I am righteous, I'm beloved, I'm healed, I'm whole, I'm loved, I'm pure, I'm above reproach, I'm more than a conqueror, I'm, I have an inheritance of Christ Jesus, I'm a royal priesthood, I'm a holy nation, right? I am I'm the beloved and I am the bride of Christ and I'm a son of God, right? Those are all true and those are all declarations. But what we think is that by just saying those declarations over and over, that builds our identity. This is how God sees me, awesome. Identity in Christ, though, is you beginning to see you the way that God sees you. Not just God's declared me as this, God's declared me as that, God's declared me as this. You tell other people, you know, God sees me this way. Awesome. Do you see yourself that way? 
I'll say right there, if you can get that identity, it doesn't matter what anybody says to you or does to you. They cannot steal your joy. They cannot steal your purpose. And they cannot steal your giftings. They cannot steal your self-image. Why? Because you see yourself the way God sees you. Amen? So no religious demon in hell can tell you you're not good enough or haven't done enough. Amen? Whatever form that religious demon takes. That could be a sister, a neighbor, a brother, a spouse, right? That religious spirit that tells you you're not enough. You know what? You and I are enough in Christ Jesus. You know why? Because Christ Jesus was enough in us. Amen? I'm saying all kinds of stuff I didn't plan on saying, but obviously this is what we needed to hear today. <laughs> I, I will say this. That in um, the 24 years of doing, I'm getting ready to enter 24 years, of doing full-time ministry. And when I say full-time, I'm workaholic, so I really mean full-time. <laughs> um, there's been, the biggest thing has been people who are broken. Ministry is about broken people. And this is why the enemy tries to keep you and I to a place where we feel broken. We see ourselves as broken. We see ourselves as lost. We see ourselves with loss. We see ourselves as traumatized. We see ourselves as dysfunctional. And if we see ourselves that way, then we lose the authority to bring truth to broken people, to traumatize people. And then so many times I've seen the dynamic where people are looking to be set free for the future from bad relationships. That they will go, and I'm not against counselors and I'm not against any of that, but they'll try to make what other people's perspective of their situation like, giving them permission to be who they can be in the future. For example... You know, you get abused, again, either emotionally, physically, sexually. You can get abused. You can have different, you know, people that rejected you and people that, you know, all the stuff that can happen. And what the world will tell you is you are a victim. And therefore, you have to live with a victim mentality. And so you will always be broken. And so now every other relationship, you have to figure out how to weave it into your brokenness. And the platform of you being rejected, now here are some ways you then make sure nobody rejects you. Guys, you and I can never, ever make someone not reject us. That's completely their decision. Amen. So if you're getting this lesson, if, if the world, and is really big on this is what you do to not be rejected, you have to become everything everybody else wants you to be so they never reject you, right? So everything that the enemy has broken, then the enemy tries to lie on top of it of how not to have it again. If you don't, you've been rejected, so this is how you don't get rejected again. And then he gives you a whole bunch of lies on how not to be rejected again. Or this is how you were abused, so this is how you always need to filter people's words through you being a victim so that you don't, get victimized again. Man, guys, I'm just telling you, more lies on top of more lies brings only what? More slavery. <laughs> and so when you and I understand our relationship with God, then we start to realize, you know, I've been set free. He's loosed the bonds on me. The oil of joy for mourning has been given to me. That's why in Isaiah chapter 53 is so powerful. We're talking about he was bruised for our transgression. He was wounded for our iniquities. The chastisement of our sins was upon him. So all of, all of our yuck, I'm not even talking about everybody else's yuck, all of our yuck was on him, praise God. And then it says, then it talks about then giving us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That's not telling you you're going to always be a victim. It says, okay, you have a spirit of heaviness. This is what happened to you. So now let me replace it with a garment of praise. Let me give you a whole new perspective of thankfulness and new life and new breath. And so now 
the spirit of the Lord being upon you and I, because what? We've closed ourselves with a new identity. We've closed ourselves with what God has for us. And so this is so important when we talk about relationships. Let me ask a question in the room, and I know I can't see the hands that are going up there on the live stream. How many of you are single in the room? Okay, and then let me see this again. How many married? Okay, it's good. It's a, good, it's a, it's a great mix. And so when we talk about both of these things, it is for both groups. It's for us as single. It's for us as married. Because you know what? Just because you're married doesn't mean that a spouse has healed your brokenness. Amen? Unfortunately for a lot of people, their spouse can be the reason for their brokenness. <clears throat> Single, if you're broken, and if you think that being broken and you find a spouse that all of a sudden you're going to be made whole, complete. No. Amen? Amen? The married people are like, preach it, sister. Okay? <laughs> right? That's not this, we don't come, this dysfunctional person and expecting another human to complete us and heal us. Healing only comes from our relationship with God. Healing is only found in that place. So that then no matter what is happening within our environment or our home, Right, Even in our bed, no matter what is happening in that place, you have the Lord God Almighty teaching you, leading you, and directing you. And I say this is so key because you can't have, and I, I, had, a, I had a message here on love, sex, and marriage. Again, you can't hear about any of these things uh, too early, whether we're single or married. And I'll, I'll jump into a little bit of this, but this dynamic of you can't do any of that without the foundation of the Lord. In um, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it talks about, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. They shall be, they, though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. This is the beauty of what God even does to our inner part. Man, the things that we were just, that's so gross, that's so broken. Man, he can cleanse and renew. And that same power, that same power can be applied. Though all your relationships are like scarlet, they can be made as white as snow. Just think about that. If our sins that truly separated us from God can be redeemed, then that means every relationship can be redeemed. And when I say every relationship can be redeemed, does that mean that you can make every relationship come back into right alignment? No, you can't make anybody, you know, apologize. You can't, you can't make them forget offense. You can't make them forget different things. There's people watching, you know, even some people that have been separated from you. I mean, legally have been separated from you. I mean, they're not, you have, a, you have restraining orders. I'm talking to somebody. You have a restraining order against somebody and you're like, I don't want that thing to be redeemed. I don't want that person back into my life. I'm not talking about proxenity of people. I'm talking about the condition of your heart. That every relationship that has become like scarlet in your heart, that brings hurt, that brings shame, that brings guilt, that brings confusion, that brings offense, can be redeemed by the Lord between you and the Lord first. Then you start getting all these practical things from the Holy Spirit. If you're supposed to reach out, if you're supposed to touch, if you're supposed to apologize, if you're supposed to connect, if you're supposed to, or if you're just supposed to let them go to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, when I pray for them, it's actually really prayer versus like, God, get them. <laughs> you know that's not prayer. Amen. Oh, Lord, just let vengeance be yours, says the Lord. Strike them today, oh, God. And start praying the prayers of uh, David. Oh, Lord, let the enemies of the, my people around me, the enemies be accursed. Let their flesh be eaten by worms. You know, have you ever read some of those where Paul, where David is just like, my enemies surround me, but you, oh, Lord, will rise up and you will smite them into the ground and you will divide them. And... <laughs> Don't say you've never prayed that prayer for somebody. It's in the Bible. 
right? No, you actually, because God can redeem things, God can cleanse things, God can give us of the right perspective. Now how you pray over somebody now is redeemed. It's a redeemed kind of prayer. Lord, I thank you that you love them. And Lord, obviously they're broken. So Lord, you heal their brokenness. And so Lord, I bless them today. Lord, I ask that you send people in their lives. Not me, I'm fine with not being in their lives. But Lord, send other people. <laughs> and sometimes God say, no, 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 you're not the one that's gonna do this. I'm going to do it in this way. So when I look at, when I look at the, the word of God, you know, the, the dynamic of what God does for us. And so in John chapter eight, John chapter eight is this powerful, these powerful verses about the woman taken in adultery. And what happens is Jesus was the only one innocent in that crowd. He who is without sin, throw the first stone. And Jesus was the only one that could have thrown the first stone. And what's powerful about that is that after everyone's left, uh, she's still standing there. And he says, where are, your, where are those who've condemned you? Where, where are your accusers? And she's like, they're not here. And he said, neither do I condemn you. And let me say this in relationships. There's a lot of condemnation we can take on our own hearts for our own mistakes in relationships. We can take on a lot of the burden of condemnation. It's not even everybody else's condemnation of our failures and faults in relationships. But we can take on our own burden. And Jesus says, listen, I don't condemn you. Can I just say today that there are things that we have to let go in our hearts and say, you know what, even though I'm not doing or did not do this right, Lord, I give this to you. And so I'm not going to be condemned anymore. And he said, go and leave your life of sin, go and sin no more. And this is not a statement of law, don't you go and sin no more. It was a statement of power. That because you're understanding what forgiveness looks like, now you have the ability to live in a way with the power of God like never before. Amen? And so now, so instead of, it's not of law, but of power. So he was empowering her to go and live and sin no longer. And this is what God does within you and I. He said, I'm empowering you to go and live in sin no more because why? We have now the spirit of God living inside of us. But in the same way, when we apply this to relationships, you and, I, you and I don't have to go out there and constantly be judged nor affected by the people around us because our relationship with God, we know how God sees us. It doesn't matter who's lifting a stone in your life telling you what you are or you are not, what you have or have not done, what you should or should not do, what you could have done better what you must do better, right? All of those voices stop trying to be the judgment within our lives and leading and directing our relationships. But now instead what's happening is you're saying, listen, I've been empowered to live out of the overflow in relationship with God. So when people rise up something against me, I understand they have no authority in my life. And so many times we accept, if I can say it this way, we accept the stonings of other people's judgments and perspectives. And then we just huddle there going, I guess so. I guess that's who I am. I guess that's what I'll always be. No. Man, you, you're saying, no, I, I don't, that, that, does, that does not hold power over me. Right? So grace empowers us to live in this aspect of, okay, now I have a source of how I'm able to respond. So let me see this, and this is going to be a couple of real practical things. I'm going to do some practical things as far as how God speaks over you today, married or single. But then if I can, I want to give some nuggets to how you speak over the people within your life. Okay, so how people, how you allow people to speak over you, but how you speak over other people. And I want to use an example of, I want to use an example of just uh, marriage here. And so I want to look at um, Psalm, Song of Solomon. So Song of Solomon, and you know, people would be like, 
Oh, we're getting racy today. Song of Solomon, okay. So in Song of Solomon, chapter, <clears throat> in chapter one. And it's interesting here, and I, I want to bring a couple things out. Song of Solomon, chapter one, verses 15. Okay, in verse 15. And there was something that really powerful happened here. He said, he says, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes are doves. And then the beloved responds back and says, oh, handsome you are, my lover. Oh, and how charming. And our bed is verdant. <laughs> I mean, it's good. Okay. That's, that's how you translate that word. Okay. Lover says, the beams of our house are cedars and our rafters are firs. And you know what? I might have got the wrong verses here. Is it chapter one? They're all good, but look at this. Let's go over here in verse um, chapter two, also here in verse 15. It says, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, or vineyards that are in bloom. And then it says, the beloved says, my lover is mine and I am his. He browses among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee. Turn my lover and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the rugged hills. So I want to say a couple different things. In chapter 2, uh, verse 1, it says, um, like a lily among the thorns is my darling among the maidens. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my lover among the young men. And there's something, there was in this, in this lesson, in Song of Solomon's, it's the way they spoke to each other. It's not that they just didn't know it, but they, it's the way they spoke. So there is a dynamic of praise, proclamation, and preparation that happens in communication in any relationship you have. Let me say that again. There is a level of praise that happens in any relationship you and I have, not just with your spouse, okay? So singles, take notes, because you can learn some things that are absolutely powerful for when you get married, all right? And for when we're married, it's like being intentional about how we talk. But this isn't just for marriage, it's just how we interact with people, how you praise. I had this, this unique thing happen. I was here in, I was here in Woodland Park and I, I went into the dollar store to get something. And um, there was this young lady there. She was, she was the cutest girl. I came around the corner and she's like, oh my gosh, I love your outfit. And I said, well, thank you very much. Said, no, I do, I do, I love it. I love the shoes, I love the jewelry, I love this, I love this. She's just, and she's just like, so cute. And I'm like, well, thank you. I said, I appreciate that. And so I kind of reached over my arm. I said, well, thank you. She goes, oh my gosh, you're a hugger. And then she, literally, she picked me up off the ground and she shook me. Oh, and I was like, ah. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure how to make out of it. I was like, okay, all right, praise God, you know? And then she goes, what zodiac sign are you? She said, what, what zodiac sign are you? And she's like, maybe you're this or that. And I said, you know, honestly, I don't know. She goes, you don't know? Well, when were you born? And I said, actually, I don't even pay attention to any of that. What I really work with is I am loved of God. And she looked at me, she goes, yeah, that works. Okay, let's go with that. And I was like, yeah, let's go with that. She was just so cute. But what happened is, and then even as she was like, okay, well, God bless you. And blah, blah, blah. She didn't, well, I said, God bless you. And she responded back, God bless you. And so even as she was leaving, I heard her complimenting two or three other people. She said, oh, young man, you've got the most gorgeous smile. And it was this beautiful African man. He had this big white smile. And he's like, well, thank you. And she was just praising. And that whole atmosphere, because she was loud, so everybody heard her. But she, like, the whole store was just full of her bubbliness. Despite her having zodiac signs and read, trying to read people, she had praise in her. She just was constantly coming alongside people. And I thought, man... And so I had gotten her name and I look for her. I look for her around Woodland Park. I really, I'm like, Lord, I want to see her again because she's got an anointing. She's got something special in the way she communicates with people. She draws things out, picks them up and hugs them, you know? So 
right? So there's this, in every relationship, you and I can get to a place where we learn how to praise the people around us. And I'm not talking about going around faking it. I'm not going around talking about flattery, but I'm talking about how can we learn to see the people around us and speak and draw out life? Because what happens when you praise somebody? They're just like, oh, thanks, you made my day. And you can say, well, how is your day? Well, I don't know, it's been kind of rough. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, I hope it gets better. Can I pray for anything? Man, you just find that praise opens up doors that nothing else does. And so in, in Song of Song, what I love is you constantly see this attribute of praise happen. And it's not just between two lovers. Guys, this is, this is a dynamic that you and I can draw the love of God and exhibit it to the people around us. Then what happens is that you can proclaim. You can proclaim the different giftings, the different insight, the different talents, the different things that happen. And then you can prepare. You can prepare for the dynamic of building more relationship or connection or, hey, let's have a coffee, right? All these type of things lead to it. And this is what happens within... Um, within this particular verses and many of these verses in Song of Psalms, it talks about praising your partner, proclaim their provision, and then prepare for passion. We were doing a premarital counseling with a, uh, some long distance individuals the other day. And so we got the part in our premarital counseling where we're talking about sex. And so we're talking about different things. <laughs> One of the things Mike and I just said, he's like, listen. Uh, Mike said, said to the young man he said, and to her, she said, he said, listen, sex does not happen in the evenings. It happens for a woman. It starts in the morning. You got to prepare for passion. Yeah. You look lovely today, dear. Is there something I can do to help you? Right? It starts in the morning, not just like, well, whatever, don't talk. And then at night be like, hey, baby. And she's like, excuse me, hey, baby. I haven't been alive all day until the evening time. No, that's not how that works. And the married lady said, amen. amen. Okay, so, <laughs> because what you're doing, you're praising and you're proclaiming because in the whole time, you're also preparing for passion. And that's just a rhythm, Right? And when I say passion, and when we're talking about not and not marriage, you can still praise and proclaim preparing for what? Connection. Not necessarily passion, because passion is supposed to be within the context of marriage. But you can prepare for connection, for deeper relationship, for deeper conversations. That's what all of this begins to lead to. So this is what's so, um, so interesting um, in these verses. Because uh, the praise your partner. So one of the things, and, and let, let me just say this, and this, um, this is definitely for marriage, but can I encourage you to think about how you would apply this within the interactions just between you and friends and church members and family members. When it says praise your partner, one of the things they did here constantly in the Song of Solomon is they admired their attractiveness. And that doesn't mean that you have to constantly say something, oh, I love your shirt, or I love your, I love your eyes, or oh, your, you know, your jacket looks so manly on you. No, I'm not saying you need to get so detailed, but you can just understand the attractiveness. You know what? You really reflect the joy of the Lord. Hey, you know what I see in you? I just see, and pull out and comment on people what is attractive about them, what attracts the world to Jesus in them. That's an important part of how you praise, right? Um, acknowledge their thoughtfulness. So many times people will do things for you, or how about, let me say it this way, how about when somebody thanks you for doing something? Like, oh, thank you so much for doing that. That really blessed me. What does it do? It, it blesses you that they were blessed and, and, and um, acknowledged your thoughtfulness. Well, in the same way, can we learn to be people? And this is part of us getting out of our comfort zone to see people. You cannot admire, you cannot acknowledge, you cannot praise, you cannot proclaim, you cannot have preparation without seeing people. To do any of this, you actually have to see people, you have to watch people. And this is what the world has done. Just look at yourself. Look at what you, look what you can do, look at who you are, look at, right? My world, my schedule, my agenda, and we don't look up. And I'll tell you the reason why the lost isn't coming to the Lord is because the church is looking down. 
We haven't looked up to see people. We haven't looked up to see who they are and be able to draw and pull out things. And that means looking and saying, Lord, what kind of compliment do you have for the people around me today? And again, I'm not talking about some manipulative flattery. I'm talking about a genuine insight that when you see people say, Lord, help me see them the way you see them. Because once you come to a place, going back to what we said here at the very beginning, once you come to a place where you're healthy and you know how God sees you, and it doesn't matter what other people say, their, their, their approval or disapproval doesn't throw you into a, a, a tailspin, right? Because you're healthy. Now you are able to see them for who they are. Because you're not constantly trying to protect yourself and you know, get everybody to love you. and you're, It's not all about you. You're good. You and God are good. You're coming from a place of health. So then the way you see people, you start to see what's attractive about them. You start to see what's of value in them. You start to recognize their thoughtfulness. You start to praise and pull out things. And you start to see not just believers, but unbelievers open their hearts to you. It's amazing. There's uh, one of the ladies in town here. I, I do a lot of friendship evangelism. So when I go in, she's like, hello, sister. I'm like, hello. And I give her a great big hug. I told her the other day, I said, hey, did you just start two new restaurants? She said, yes. And I'm like, look at you taking over the town. She goes, oh, yeah, I feed, I feed the whole town. I said, good. You know, just loving on her, just connecting with her, right? And then she brought the food to the car because Mike had brought some. And she said, do you have kids in there? Oh, let me go back. And she went back and got sodas for the kids. Oh, just be blessed, right? It's this dynamic of if you make an effort, you open people's hearts. You know, it's so awesome. I've been trying to minister the Lord to them. And I was ministering to some, I've been ministering to different students here. Well, some of the students I've been ministering to her just led her daughter to the Lord. And so it's like, oh, yay, right? Never underestimate the attention that you can give to people to open up their hearts and lives. So we talked about admire attractiveness, acknowledge thoughtfulness, and affirm their uniqueness. This is, this is what, when we see in the Song of Psalm, affirm their uniqueness, it says, like a lily among thorns is my darling among the maidens. It's like, you know what makes you so unique? You know what makes you special? You know what I see in you? Guys, I'll just tell you, this is a powerful attribute of relationship. And again, we're only able to see the uniqueness and the talents and the gifts in people when we personally have recognized those things within ourselves. I'm not saying that the same thing, but you've got to understand you are unique to the Lord. You are absolutely a treasure in God's hand. And when we know that that's how God sees us, then we're not in some weird false comp competition with the people around us. They can be beautiful and crazy unique and you are not insecure about it. Man, that is so important. Man, in a world that the, the world, in a world where they are trying to pit you against somebody else, you're nothing unless you look like this. And if you can't do this, Right? And they try to make, whether it's education or beauty or talent or popularity or your, what you own, how much you own, your finances, your bank account. They're trying to make it that you can't be anything until it looks like that. And then the closer you get to that, guess what? The marker moves. And so they're constantly saying you're not unique in any form or fashion. You just got to be what? Conformed to this world. And the world is trying to bring conformity. You don't have a voice. You can't have an opinion. You can't have a different stance, right? And so you and I being a voice to recognize and draw the uniqueness of the people around us is part of helping them get transformed by the renewing of their mind. So you know how the, well, you know how God sees you? Man, God sees you like this. And you're so good at this. You're so unique. You're so special. Guys, I'm telling you, that's the language of God. When you start speaking that way to the people around you. But it's hard to lift up someone else if we haven't died to ourselves. So it's this understanding of we got to have a good value system. We got to know who we are, that we're loved, that God has great things for us. And at the same time, be like, it is not about me. Right. And if we can die to ourselves then we can constantly be pulling people around us and encouraging them and drawing things out of them. Why? Because our identity in Christ is solid. We're not in any weird competition. And man, I've just seen it. And 
I, I won't say how men are because I don't know how men are. I'm married to one, but that doesn't mean I understand them <laughs> at all. <laughs> but as far as with women, man, there is crazy weird competition that can happen. There's a constant comparison the enemy is trying to do. And, if, and, and that will continue to plague us and continue to be a voice in telling us we can't be more. Sometimes we don't even need other people telling us we can't be more because we got this own internal script playing. Because what? We're allowing this competition and comparison with the people around us. We'll never step into another, this kind of interaction with people if we're completely insecure. And so when I see people who are, they compliment, they encourage, they motivate, they, they, they pull people in, they gather people together. I see secure people in the Lord because they have ability to draw people to a better version of themselves and they have ability to draw people into the version of how God sees them. And then because of that, they have this ability to draw people to each other. And guys, I'm telling you, this is something we need to learn because in revival and as we connect people to each other, this is important. Let me take two more minutes here. Um, so we talked about praise. Then we talked about proclaim. And one of the big things in Song of Solomon is that the beloved was always proclaiming the provision of her partner. Oh, he takes care of me. Oh, he provides just like this. So it's, it's the tell others how they protect you and tell others how they please you. You know what? I just, you know what? I'm really thankful. And you know, this is the thing. I have to be intentional. This is something intentional about how I talk about my husband. So I was on a cruise one time. I'd gone with another lady. She had won a, 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 a cruise and so she could bring a guest. So she invited me to go with her. So Mike and I talked about it. And he said, yeah, I think this would be good. And, and um, so I went on this cruise and this, in this cruise, there's a whole bunch of people from her company. I think there was like 900 people on the ship uh, in that particular company. So it created kind of this unique environment. Not, they were strangers, but they weren't because they were all kind of had the same culture and language and, you know, the company thing that they were doing. And so I remember there was this um, single guy that started hanging around us. There were a couple times we interacted and he says, well, where are you guys going? Can, can I come along? And she's like, sure. And, and so we we're talking different things and we'd have different conversations and we were walking somewhere one day and he said, you know what? He goes, I really want to meet your husband. And I said, Mike, you want to meet Mike? And he said, yeah, I do. And he said, because the way you talk about him makes me want to meet him. And I was like, oh, wow. And I didn't even realize it. And he said, man, he just sounds really awesome, just the way you talk about him. And I thought, man, isn't that a reflection of our life with the Lord? I really want to meet your Lord. It's the way you talk about him. And guys, we got to be intentional about the way we talk about the Lord, the way we talk about each other, the way we promote, right? So proclaim proclaiming the provision and the uniqueness, even not just to that person about them, but proclaiming it about other people. Man, your pastor sounds awesome. I gotta meet this guy, right? Man, your sister sounds fun. I'd love to meet her. What you and I have so much power in our words when we talk about each other and when we talk about other people to each other, right? That people wanna make connections just by the way we talk about people. What a powerful, what a powerful thing, right? And lastly, prepare for, prepare for passion. So in the sense of marriage, the more you talk and the more you edify, what are you doing? You're preparing for passion. You're preparing for greater conversation, even intimacy. But even in everyday relationships, you prepare for connection, right? Because what you're doing is you're opening the pathways like, hey, if you ever need anything, let me know. You don't just go around saying that randomly to people and they're like, okay, man, there has to be connection. There has to be this something that happens. And it's like, hey, if anything happens again, just give me a call. And they'll actually give you a call. Why? Because connection happened in the rest of your conversation. And it provides for more opportunities. And this is key, not just for our family and our friends and our spouses being single or being married. This is also key because this has to do with the relationships God wants to bring within our lives. Amen. 
Well, I have seven, eight more pages, but we are out of time. But I do want to invite Tanera up again, so we're going to do some questions. But can I just encourage you that, again, the health of your relationship with God will cause overflow. Cause an overflow out of you, but it causes an overflow of how you start representing the love of God, the life of God, the perspective of God to the people around you. Amen. So I just like to issue a challenge. Uh, how are you going to praise? How are you going to proclaim? And how are you going to prepare? So maybe take one or two people. You don't want to take everybody. 50 people you got to like send a thank you note to or, or you know a letter to no that's not what I'm talking about ask the Lord who's one or two people you say you know what who could I praise who could I just pull aside and say you know what I just see this in you and I just want to recognize I want to acknowledge this how do you proclaim you know what this is what you bring this is what you've done I want to thank you so find those one or two people ask the Lord who do you need to start doing that to and then who is one or two people you need to do that about? You need to change your words of how you talk about someone else that's in your life right now to the people around you. And maybe it's a great relationship. Can you start bringing connection? Figure out how to share with other people so they're like, Ooh, I would like to meet them. Because I'll tell you right now, the people in your life aren't just going to receive from you. They need more people around them. And you want to make sure you're not the only source in someone's life. Amen. So you got to start talking about other people. You know what? I need to have you have coffee with my friend. Or you know what? You should come to our Bible study. You would love these people. Man, they're just, oh, they're great. You should come. You need to start talking about other people so that friends, family, people in your life don't just expect you to be everything. You start connecting them to more people. So these are practical things, but I can just tell you, it makes you have to be intentional and it has to, you have to get over your own competitiveness. You have to get over your own insecurities and be bold enough to lift somebody else above yourself. Amen. All right. So there's a lot more I want to say, but I hope that there are some nuggets for you today in something that you can do to be intentional with the people around you from the strength of your relationship with God. So, Amen. All right, wow, what a powerful teaching. Amen from Miss Carrie Pickett. Wow, I took so many notes, <laughs> right? Oh gosh, I'm sitting, I'm like, oh, so much I'm gonna have to learn how to use. <laughs> um, so thank you for sharing. It was powerful. I'll probably steal your notes later. Amen. Um, but we have some great questions that have come in. And just real quick, I apologize. I did not proclaim this out, but you guys have sent in great questions. But for those of you that are here, as well as anyone who's watching us online, um, so right now we're stepping into a time of question and answer. And so we invite you to send us your questions. Um, you can text them to us at 719-212-2555. Um, if you're watching online or you're international and you want to send in questions, you can do that at live, or this is live questions at awmi.net. And so I encourage you to do that for us. We have some great questions already coming in, but you can still send yours and we'll still do our best to get to as many of them as we can. So Amen. thank you so much. I love q and I think it's some of like, when people hear a question, they're like, yes, that was my question. I didn't know that was my question, but that's my question. So I always think that God says some really good things. Amen. Yes, yes. and we've got some great questions. Okay. And so if you're ready, we'll jump into our first one. So our first question says, Carrie, I started dating someone that we both believe we've heard from the Lord that this is him directing us. Mm -hmm. says, my question is, what is a healthy balance between giving him a place as an authority in my life, but still seeking godly counsel and then that authority in my life? So how do I balance those two? Yeah, the Bible talks about when Jesus says, wives submit to your own husbands, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of truth within this. There's a lot of uh, unique applications within this. So number one, before you get married, your first submission is to the Lord. Amen right? It absolutely. He's the one. So it's not like, even if you feel like someone is going to be your spouse, oh, I have a leg cramp. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, so anyway, <laughs> when, when, yeah, can you rub my leg while I answer this? No. Okay. So, um, when you have somebody that you know that you're supposed to get married to, that you, st you still need to seek counsel. A multitude, even when you're married, married you have a multitude of, of counselors that are based in the word. Because your mother-in-law will be like, I'm a counselor. 
honey, baby, I got wisdom. And you'd be like, no, 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 not for mom, right? Okay. So you got to determine who has the authority to even speak into your life, not just future spouse, but even the multitude of counselors. That's wisdom. Right? There's wisdom in people around you that are strong. There can be even wisdom in a, spa, in a future spouse. And you can tell this is God, right? But at the end of the day, you have to be able to balance that all out to the word. And it has to be balanced out to what God is telling you to do. So they may have a position even of, um, uh, you may be engaged. And there's this position of engagement. Even in, in Mike and I's engagement, all of a sudden, I wasn't like, hey, you're in charge of my finances. You're in charge of my decisions. We weren't married yet. I still had to steward and own the things that God had called me to do until there was the covenant relationship. Because then in that covenant relationship, then there was the grace yeah for us to communicate and submit one to another at a different level. And so I would just be really careful, you know, if, and, if, and here, let me say this, if you've got a, a future spouse and say you're single and they start trying to exhibit a whole bunch of control and we're getting married, so you need to do this. Or the woman's like, we're getting married, so you need to change in this before marriage. Let me just tell you, red flags because that's gonna be way amplified within marriage. And so you need to watch if there's that, you gotta submit woman because we're getting married. Man, that's not, a health, that's not a healthy way to start. And so I would definitely get some counsel on that before entering into any type of relationship. Amen. That's a powerful word there too. There is a safety in a multitude of counsel, but using wisdom, who's in that multitude of counsel? Yes. That was beautiful. So we have another question for you. And this one says, um, it says, Carrie, you mentioned growing into the destiny that God has for us. And it says, how can I discover what my destiny for me is or if I'm even moving in the right direction? Okay, so that's like an eight hour teaching. Okay, so are you ready? No. <laughs> no, actually I'm teaching that. Um, I'm teaching that here in Karis Bible College right now. And I just finished a series on my daily television program. And I would encourage you to go to that lifefoundations.net. So lifefoundations.net or in gospeltruth.tv. I did a series called The Joy of Walking in Your Vision. And talk specifically about how do you discover what God's vision for your life is, right? And so there is a dynamic of it's in relationship. And you always hear me go back to this, guys, because it is the heartbeat of everything within Christianity is that it's about relationship with God. So you're not going to know who you are and what you're supposed to be if you don't know who your creator is. Yeah, but once you get to know your creator... And I said this today, and I, I, I was like, man, God, that's good. You know, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. I said, you know, um, if you have a weak relationship with God, you have a weak destiny. Ooh, that's good. If you have a strong relationship with God, you have a strong destiny. Because if you have a weak relationship with God, your destiny is always small because you're always going to do it in your own strength. Ooh, if you have a strong relationship with God then the overflow of that relationship causes you to step into things that are way bigger than yourself and you have a big destiny. So deep relationship with God, deep destiny. And so that's where you have to come back to, okay, what, are you, what is the relationship? I would say to this person, what is your relationship with God like? And if that's not strong, then you don't want to find purpose and, and, and destiny and, and destination without him. Because you may say, oh, this is my destination. Come on, Jesus, let's go. And Jesus is like, <laughs> you don't even know me and you're heading the wrong direction. You think that's the de de destination. But man, can I tell you, I have a beautiful path for you to go on. And if you try to do this in yourself, um, you know, you'll be going around the mountain. You know, the she'll be going around the mountain when she comes. Yeah. That's not a good purpose song because you're just going around, going around, going around the mountain when she comes <laughs> is not a good song as far as our calling with God. So I would encourage them. Um, so I also have a series on that. And I also have a devotional that helps go through all of these really, really key questions that a person can then sit and talk to the Lord and ask about. Because so, sometimes finding out your vision isn't so much about asking God, but it's asking God the right questions. That's so good. So and I have a whole bunch of really key questions of things you can start asking the Lord. So. Amen. And that's lifefoundations.net where they can go get the teaching yeah. and the devotional there as well. Yes. And it's called um, Walking in the Joy of Your Vision. Walking in the joy of your vision. Check it out. Walking in the joy of your vision. That's awesome. So we have so many great questions here. So our next one says, <clears throat> hold on. There we go. How can I learn to see someone that has hurt me as valuable? Do I have to be their friend again? Do I have to trust them? 
No, you don't have to be their friend again. And no, um, trust is not just something that you just, well, I forgave him, so I have to trust him. No, trust got broken because it got broken. So trust has to, even though God's love is unconditional, in human relationship, trust has to be rebuilt, right? That's right. And so you can get to a place where you can forgive somebody. Mm. You can let it go. You can get a fence out of your heart. You genuinely speak life over them. You genuinely say, Lord, I know you love them. <laughs> You're the only one that does, but I know you love them, right? Okay, so you can get to a place where You can get to a place where you can say, Lord, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to see them the way you see them, but that doesn't mean you give them a key to your house. Mm, come on. Amen? That doesn't mean they get to come over for Christmas. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's sometimes there's some, I can, I can release them and value them, but I don't give them access to my life. Because sometimes people are just at a point of their brokenness mm -hmm. that you have to say, Lord, I release them to you. And Lord, I'm going to pray over them. And there might be sometimes you might, you might grab coffee with them. But just because I have coffee with the person doesn't mean I trust them. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Because trust is something you, you build. And it's like, just because I had coffee with somebody doesn't mean they get to come over and babysit my children. Oh, no. Right? And so the, I think there's this dynamic of you can make connection, but you don't have to give full full-blown access and sometimes people will be like I thought you forgave me so you know why aren't we why aren't we best friends no 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 no. you're not called to be my best friend you're too broken right now but I'm gonna there's gonna be things that I release you to and speak over and I might do different things but I don't give you full access nor do I allow full access to you like I'm not I'm not your savior and sometimes people once once they hurt you and they try to restore something um, they either want you to fix them or you think you need to fix them. And that's not our job. That's God's job. And so that's how God then starts to build trust again if, if trust is supposed to be given. So No, that's powerful. I love too how it's letting the Lord, like you're sharing, letting the Lord lead, that if the Lord wants restoration, let him lead that yeah. back to. That's beautiful. Amen. So I have another question. It's a little bit along the same lines. It says, what is the best way to receive constructive criticism? I've been hurt by feedback in the past by others, so it's hard for me to receive any kind of criticism. How do I know what's good feedback and what's worth disregarding? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, number one, I would say um, sometimes cr a, um, a critique is solicited and sometimes it's unsolicited. <laughs> um, sometimes unsolicited critique, criticism, you know, when they come in, oh, by the way, honey, this is what you need to do. And you know, when you said this and you know, oh, by the way, your children, can I give you some tips? And you're like, I did not ask you for your critiques. So sometimes it's unsolicited. And so that's where you have to really guard your heart um, because it's like, whoa, it just kind of kind of comes out of left field and it feels like an attack, right? Really good. And that doesn't necessarily mean that their motive wasn't genuine or wasn't pure. They just, sometimes people who come with unsolicited criticism or cr being a critic in your life, um, it's really sometimes done out of genuine, I want you to be better. And so what I, what I have chosen to do um, is that, I, and I get a lot of critiques whether I want it or not, right? And you know, Carrie, what we need to do better in the ministry. And you know how you could say this, and you know how you could, <laughs> you know how you could dress different like this? I get all kinds of interesting things. I've had people that sent in letters of different things I could do. <laughs> Three-page letters of this is the way I think you could do things better. And it's like, and what was your name again? And so... But what I've chosen to do is have just respond with humility. That's good. You know what? There might be 75,000 things wrong, but there's one nugget in here. Mm. And so if I'm teachable, I can learn to receive the nugget, chew up the chicken, and spit out the bones. That's really good. But again, you can only do that when you have a good identity in the Lord. Mm, that's powerful. Right? And so when people start criticizing you, right, you can just be like, well, thank you for your perspective. I'm going to take it to the Lord and receive direction. So um, God bless you. I don't quite see it the way you see it, but it's a different a perspective that I'll take to the Lord. I can disagree and, or I can be like, well, and I've had people come up with all kinds of weird doctrine, you know, like, you know, you should teach more on this. And I'm like, well, 
The Bible doesn't say that, so you'll probably never hear me say that, but I'm glad you were listening to my message. That really blesses me. <laughs> you can, I can find something good out of it, right? And so that's probably one of those dynamics. Now with the people that it's solicited where you're saying, hey, could you give me feedback? What do you think? Is there something you see within my life? You definitely opened a door. So who you open the door to then is critical. You don't just ask for everybody's opinion. Well, what do you think? And be wise in who you allow, who you ask to speak into your life. Because when you do, you are definitely asking, you're opening the door in humility because you're wanting to hear some things. But just understand that even in their critiques, that isn't, it, that isn't thus says the Lord, right. right? And you can be like, okay, that's interesting. I'm going to ponder. I'm going to think on that. Mm. And, I, and I don't have to just be like, you know, absolutely, I rebuke that. Sometimes if people are speaking negative and death over me, I'll be like, I don't receive that. Mm, that's good. Right? So there are times I'm going to respond and be like, nope, I don't receive that. And then there's times I can be like, okay, you know what, well, let me pray about that. And the Lord will say, don't receive that. And I'll be like, okay, I rebuke that then. I don't receive that. That's Does that make sense? And so I think that's one of the ways if you've, if you've gotten hurt in the past, you get, come to a place where, again, your relationship with the Lord, like, Lord, even, even, the, even the psalmist said, Lord, if there's, show me any hidden and presumptuous sin within me. It was this tenderness of Lord, like, hey, Lord, my heart is open. If there's anything that needs correction, hey, Lord, have at it. And that's where we go. That's where we go for the critique. That's where we go for the change. So let's just be really careful of who we invite into our lives to do that. And then if come, people come unsolicited, say, thank you. I don't think I asked for your opinion on that, but you definitely have one. So anyway, well, thank you for your opinion. Again, you can get to a place where it's just water off your back. So it doesn't have to, it does not have to wound you. And any wounds you have had, God can heal them. That's beautiful too. I love even coming back to where you said receiving it with humility, but yeah. even that humility being tied to knowing who you are in Christ and knowing your identity. Yeah. That was beautiful. Um, so again, we have so many great questions. So I have another one for you. Um, so this one says, how can I tell the difference between if I'm being friendly or if I'm being flirtatious? Mm, this is good. Um, so one of, the, one of the lessons I had here that, you know, like the seven pages that we didn't get to um, was a, a ton of scriptures in uh, friendship. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things um, that friendship talks about, there's, there's actually key things like friendship talks about a man who has friends must himself be friendly, Amen. right? And so uh, there's an aspect of friendly and the, what's the difference between friendliness and flirtatiousness, right? But then it, it says this, Greater love is no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. John chapter 15, verse 13. Well, if you're just being flirtatious, you're like, hey, ha, huh? are you saying, hey, I'm willing to die for you? No. <laughs> There's a difference between I'm being flirtatious and, hey, I'll lay my life on the line for you. Mm. It kind of starts showing some, some of the motivations. How far am I willing to go? You know, am I just, you know, just trying to get something? Flirtatiousness is always about you. It's not about them. So Flirtatiousness is not about, I'm flirting with you because I want to make you feel so amazing. <laughs> Flirtatiousness is I'm flirting with you because I want to pull something. I want to pull a response back from you that makes me feel good. Aww. Where friendship is about, this is not about me, it's about you. Mm. So it's a good way to tell the difference between flirtatiousness and friendship. And so, and again, in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all time. And it says, a brother is born for adversity. Man, real friendship is willing to go through the fire, willing to go through difficulty, where flirtatiousness is like, hey, you stop, ignore, you, you ignore me and give that girl attention, you're dead to me, right? They're not willing to go through ad adversity because now you don't give me anything for my affection and attention. So now I'll just find somebody else to be flirtatious with. And so real friendship bursts something that will go through the fire with someone or flirtatiousness, you know, a girl can be, or a guy, a guy can be super flirtatious with somebody. She leaves and the next person walks in the door, baby, how are you? Well, what happened to other babykins over here? Babykins, babykins, baby muchka, like all the kind. It's like, it's just the next one because there's a, there's this, there's this addiction of what can I do to attract them to me? That's why when you see a flirt, they're usually an addicted flirt. They flirt with everybody. They'll just flirt with one person. 
They flirt with everybody because it's something they need for themselves. So I would just, in, in evaluating your relationship, why, if, if you're having, am I a friend or being a flirt? Yeah. You know, and there's sometimes you can really are trying to be a friend, but you, you look like the world. So that's when you ask the Holy Spirit, like, Lord, Holy Spirit, if I do anything that looks flirtatious and that's not my motivation, can you show me so that I honor you in every interaction? And I've known a lot of married women that think that they can be flirtatious because, oh my gosh, you know, I'm married. Like, no, I'm not flirting with them. But the way they laugh, the way they giggle, the way they touch somebody's arm, oh, stop it. It's flirtatiousness. <laughs> exactly. See, you got it. You, you got it. Stop it. <laughs> I'm watching you. Right? Okay, so it's like this whole dynamic, like how you interact with people, um, you got to make sure it doesn't look like the world. So. Amen. No, that's... Uh... I'm gonna receive that one, that's a good one. Um, so I have another question for you. This says, I have always had a hard time making close friends. I have a lot of friends, but very few close friends. How do you go about finding and building those close knit relationships? Well, can I say this, that, that sometimes there's this impression that everybody has to have a whole bunch of close friends. No, you don't. You don't have to have a whole bunch of close friends. You can have, uh, uh, different levels, you know, you have your intimate relationships, right? The, those deep, personal, uh, vulnerable relationships, people that you trust with a certain level of your heart and your time and your attention and your future. And then there's people that you know well, you, 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 you can tell numerous things about them, but, but they're not the first person you're going to call. Yeah. They're not the person you know is going to drop everything and come over. Right? There's not a born for adversity type dynamic, but, but you're getting to know each other. And then there's people you're like, hi, it's good to see you. Hey, you have some coffee. Oh, yeah. And when you have coffee, how are you doing? What's going on? And you may get into a little depth, but it's not like, let's go back to the house. I mean, let, let's, let's, you know, let, let's go on a retreat. Hey, let's get our husbands. In. Let's get our children. Let's, let's, you know, let's arrange our children's marriage. Like, I mean, it's not that type of friendship, right? It's just, so there's different levels and that is okay. Sometimes people think, well, because I'm a Christian, everybody's got to be my best friend. Mm. No, you don't give, you don't, honestly, you don't have the time to give that level to everybody. You don't have the emotional energy to give that to everybody. So if you have one or two, that's totally fine. And there were seasons of my life, I did not have any super, super, super close people in my life because I was the teacher I was the mentor, I was the team leader, I was the pastor. And I didn't have anybody at that level that was holding me. They were always coming to me to get something, to receive something, to, to pull on me for something. And so I had to realize in that time, you know, Lord, I, I believe you can bring people in my life and I'm open, but I was super careful who I gave access to, to have that level of friendship in my life. So what I did is, and it sounds cheesy, but it's not. Jesus was my best friend. Amen. Jesus was six closer than a brother. Right. And he became that source of relationship so that then I had the ability to give out to the kind of people that God started bringing me. And I started to learn how to be able to receive from them because I had a good relationship with God. Right? So I went through a season where, you know, again, I had some peer relationships, but I wouldn't say they were my best friend, right? And so I think that's what you got to be careful of is that you're not just saying, well, I guess I'm not, I don't have any friends because I don't have a best friend. I didn't have a best friend in Russia. I didn't. 16 years. Well, I should say seven years. I did not have a best friend in Russia until I married Mike. And even then, Mike could not become my source. My source still had to be the Lord. And so I think just, just being careful of the different. And sometimes you have seasons that you have a really close friend, but then you start to part and go different ways. And when you meet, you can connect, and it's like you've not any time lost. But it doesn't, it's not that same in every single season. So just be careful that you don't think that deep friendships are, are means you're good at relationship. Sometimes God has you where you just have a multitude of people and you might have one close person. That's okay. So I just want to 
I want to say that about relationships. No, I think that was great. And this actually, this next question I think is really good to back up with that one. And the question is, is where do you draw the line between what you share with a close friend and what should just remain between you and your spouse? Well, I, I think it depends on who, who your close friend is, mm. right? There's different things that, um, okay, for example, one of, my, one of my best friends right now, for those on live stream, you may not know who this person is, but Elizabeth Murin is, she and I, man, it's just like, we're going to sharpen, iron sharpen iron. We're going to come out like needles after we talk to each other, right? But she's at a level of spiritual maturity and relationship. And so I don't share with Elizabeth anything that I haven't talked to Mike about. And so that's just one of those protective things. So we don't get to the point where we're gossiping over here about Mike or she's gossiping about her husband, mm. right? Now I may say how, I need prayer in this because I'm trying to figure out how to do this better in my marriage. And she may say, well, and she's given me some really prophetic words, honey, this, this, and this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a word from the Lord, right? And so I'm only gonna share things that I know I'm gonna get godly counsel on. I don't go to somebody and whine about my husband for them to join, tune their violin and start whining with me. Right. No, I want somebody to be like, okay, bring out the word. Hey, sister, get your attitude right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the things we have to be careful of. Now, if a girl has her, what she calls her best friend is someone outside of her husband, that's dangerous. Come on. So you don't share with somebody of the opposite gender about your spouse what you can't share with your spouse. Period. Wisdom. Mic drop on that one. <laughs> Amen. Um, so I have some more. Again, we just have so many great questions we want to try to get to. Um, so the next question says, I'm dealing with condemnation from mistakes I've made in my past. Mm -hmm. How do I learn to accept God's love and forgiveness yet still be on guard that I don't fall into those same mistakes? What I love, um, there's an author, he wrote a book called Failing Forward. John Maxwell, Dr. John Maxwell wrote a book called Failing Forward. And I just love the title because this is the thing. Sometimes when we fail, we have to start seeing that, man, I can fail forward. Man, I can learn. I can grow. I don't have to make this mistake again without being in condemnation. Like, man, I just have so much regret about that. Man, if I'd known. This is what happens many times when people hear the word of God. They go, oh, man, if I had known that. Oh man, I wouldn't have done. And so they'll actually take what a message is meant to inspire them. They'll, they'll let the devil try to immediately steal that word and say, you know, if you'd known that 10 years ago, this and this and this wouldn't have happened. Mm. Man, if you had known that. And he tries, the enemy tries to steal the word at that moment. And so this is what, what happens with our testimony. We can, we, we, shame and guilt can try to come up and we say, no, 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 that's under the blood of Jesus. I know how God sees me. And because God sees me this way now, I'm going to stand on my past and it's going to become my proclamation and my foundation of my testimony. And so that's one thing you just had to make that decision because the enemy will try to bring that past and you say, yep, I wish I had known then. Man, I wish I had known these truths, but I didn't. But Lord have mercy, now I do. And watch out, <laughs> devil, because look what I know now. Mm. And so you have to have it with this attitude about your past. Yeah? yeah. Uh, was it messy? Yes. Does it continue to be messy? No. Now, from that mess, now I have all, this going to sound a weird analogy, now I have all the tools, all the cleaning supplies to make sure, mm. right? All the truth now to tell and help other people be set free from their messes. And so you got to look at it. You got to just say, anytime the enemy brings it up, it's like, enemy, you're trying to bring up my past. Let me remind you exactly what your future is. Let me remind you because of those things. Now I'm equipped to help other people in their present and their futures. And you just got to start preaching to that and have that right attitude. I love that, man. That's just stepping into your identity of who you mm -hmm. are in Christ and letting that Amen. be, like you said, the tool that helps you combat when the enemy tries to come against you yep. with lies of the enemy of who you were. Amen. Amen. Um, so we have another question for you. This one says, um, should you be in a romantic relationship with a person who doctrinally believes different? For example, two people are both Christians, mm -hmm. but say one person believes in healing, but the other does not. Okay. Well, and this is part of my testimony because... Mike and I weren't on the same page doctrinally, right? And I, I was telling this the second year the other day here at Karis Bible College. Um, I don't think I understood how off his doctrine was until he got the truth. <laughs> He's like, did you know when I was like, yeah, oh Lord, you didn't. 
<laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, you didn't know that? <laughs> and so there were some things we argued about before marriage, you know, and it's like, no, 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 no. And ours wasn't necessarily about healing, but it was like, you know, you, you earn your salvation, you keep your salvation. And it was just like this dynamic of spiritual body. We just were coming from it from two different things. And I don't think I even realized how off we were. But I did pray about it and said, Lord, you know, there's some things. Is, it, is this, are we unequally yoked? I did. I asked the question. And I was ready to pause our engagement and pause our marriage based on whatever the Lord said. And I think that's what's important. Because sometimes you can be with, you can be interested in a person and you want to be with them so much you're willing to sacrifice the word of God. No, 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 no. Man, you got to place it on the word of God and you're willing to sacrifice a relationship because the word is truth. Amen. And so I, when I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, am I supposed to, I know you've told me I'm supposed to marry him. So when, Lord, when, because he's got some things he's got to get in his heart. And the Lord specifically told me when to marry. He said, I'm after his heart. Two weeks after we married, he had a total revelation and transformation. But I know it was also because we waited that six months and we talked about the word and we talked about the word. We talked about the word. I will say this about healing about prosperity, about different things. When you, your child is sick and you get a diagnosis and you're saying, let's stand and believe in faith and the other spouse says, no, they're gonna die. Man, I'll tell you right now, that's, that's life and death right there. Come on. And so there are some things doctrinally that are life and death. Come on. Absolutely. So now, you know, one may say, well, I really like using the word sanctification. Well, no, 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 technically it's justification. Well, I don't know, maybe it's purification. Like that's not a life and death thing. Now, if it's going to cause you want to rip each other's hair out, well, then you might wait on it, okay? <laughs> but there's some, there's some things that are life and death. So and so that's where you have to really ask the Lord before you continue the relationship in that way. Amen. I love that you share, too, that you have to be willing to let the relationship go for the word's sake. Yeah. So I think that's so powerful is knowing, like you said, the motive, the heart behind it. Yeah. That's so good. So I have another question for you about a relationship. It says, do I need to find my purpose or my destiny before I find my spouse? I think you don't wait to find a spouse to start seeking your destiny. Amen. Can I say that? Mm. Like, well, I know there's a call of God in my life, but when I get married, then I'll start asking the Lord. No, 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 no. You don't wait until you get married mm. to this individual. You don't wait until you get married. You got to start walking in your calling and your giftings now. Do you know the fullness of it, the breadth of it? No, no. But you start, but sometimes people are waiting like, well, when I get married, and they're just sitting there waiting for Prince Charming or, you know, their Cinderella to come along. And then I'm telling you right now, a real woman of God and a real man of God is not looking for a couch potato. Come on. Can I say that again? A real man of God and a real woman of God is not looking for a couch potato. I'm just sitting for somebody who's just being lazy, just waiting on God and wasting years and days and breaths of God. their life. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking for somebody who's passionately pursuing God in obedience. And they're, they're looking for somebody who's going after the Lord. And I'll just tell you right now, husbands and wives, the most attractive thing about your spouse is when they're falling in love with God. Because what happens as they're pursuing God, as they're discovering their gifts and their callings and their passions and their dreams and their purposes, and this starts to come out of them, you're like, oh, baby. Come on. Wow. Right? <laughs> It's awesome when you start to see vision come alive in your spouse. It's like, wow, that's beautiful. So you don't just wait ever. Even when you're married, you don't stop and be like, well, you know, I'm just following him or I'm just whatever her gifts are. You know, we'll just do whatever she wants. No, this is something that now you get to grow in together. And I remember when the Lord spoke to me because I was like, Lord, what about Mike? What about his calling? What about my calling? And the Lord spoke something very specific to me. He said, it's not yours it's hit or his. It's about one I want to build together. Oh, amen. And so that ultimately that's what happens is when you're each following your destiny, when they come together, God wants to build something together mm -hmm. that becomes so much more powerful than just you and your calling. But come on, let's bring some chips to the table. Mm -hmm. Bring some identity, bring some purpose, bring some seeking after the Lord from your own life to the table so that God can bring it together amen. to be bigger. Gosh. So much wisdom tonight, right? Oh, I love it. So I have one last question for you, and then I know we're going to have to close. But this last question says, I've heard you're supposed to be best friends with the one you marry. So how can I become friends with the opposite gender correctly? 
Well, I think this, and, and I talk a lot about friendship as far as with, um, especially if you're single, but even for married, you've got to learn how to have friendship. Because sometimes a, a, a casual, just, you know, nice friendship to you, the other person is like, they love me. <laughs> right? And so there's ways. Um, I encourage as far as with uh, friendships with the opposite gender is the moment you start spending one-on-one -on -one time, it starts morphing into more than friendship. Yeah. It starts morphing into, I wonder if. Yeah, it does. I wonder if, well, I don't know. And then the way people see you starts to put on an external pressure to your friendship mm -hmm. because people think you're together. And then there's this moments where it's just, it's all of a sudden, I'll just tell you, every single guy friend I had, if I ever spent time with them alone, there was always a moment like, hmm, could they be my husband? Mm. It, was, it was uncanny how many times that happened, right. right? And then it would be like, no, I don't think so. But again, when you start spending time with a lot of person, mm -hmm. even in friendship with the opposite gender, soul ties can happen. That's true. Yeah. Right? Because again, let me say this again in friendship with the opposite gender what starts happening you can start to admire and acknowledge and affirm them start to praise and proclaim because you're friends right the moment you start doing that just like the psalm of, Sol of solomon it starts to open up your heart yep, that's it. and so i encourage with friendships you do friendships in group settings there's just, in, again, there's a multitude of counselors that begins to keep it where your friendship is about something bigger than just me spending time with you. It doesn't mean we can't talk, but, and it doesn't mean that you can never do anything alone, but I'm just telling you the danger of that is, is that every friendship has the opportunity to go down a road. And so you have to ask, I'm, I'm, I always encourage people, you need to ask the Lord, who are your friends supposed to be? especially of the opposite gender, because your heart may be totally pure, totally about friendship, yeah. but you have no idea the hidden hurts, longings, or desires of that other person. Right. And they can say, oh no, we're just friends. No, oh no, we're just friends. Yeah, we're just friends. But secretly inside, I want it to be more. But I just say we're friends because he says we're friends, so I'm friends, so we're just friends. But the whole time, if he said, hey, would you date? You'd be like, oh baby, yeah. <laughs> right, you wanna marry me? Yep. Today, yep. yep. <laughs> Wait, I thought we were just friends, right? And so what can happen is you can actually start to play a game Oof, yeah. with our hearts and a game in friendship and still call it friendship, but there's actually something you want more. So I just always say one of the best things to do is you have wisdom in how you spend time with the people around you, and then you're careful with how much you share, even with a friend. It's good. Right? There's things that you know, and you know it, and, and this is the same for marrieds as well. You know when something's precious to you. And you know when you take something precious and reveal it and put it on the table and entrust somebody with an emotion, a thought, a challenge, an addiction, a desire. You know whether you're single or married. So when you start putting something out on the table and you're realizing, whoa, that was way too intimate to share with somebody who was not my spouse. You know when it is. And so you just ask the Holy Spirit, like, Lord, keep me aware of what I pull out because it's like a treasure. It talks about your heart has the treasures therein. You have treasures, you have thoughts, you have dreams, you have wishes. And so you know how to be careful then to put them on the table. And this is one of the things in friendship that the Holy Spirit can guide you in. So. Amen. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for your time. And I know I, question and answer is your favorite time. It's definitely one of mine. And yeah. I believe for all of you as well, you sent in so many great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but thank you so much for your ministry today. Amen. Can I pray for you guys? All right. This is not just for everyone in the room, but for those on live stream, you, again, we're at different seasons of our lives. And so God is committed. This is what I love. God is committed to your growth and your transformation. God's committed to the relationships within your life because yes. he wants to reveal himself mm. through you, to you. He wants to reveal yourself through them, mm. right? That you're reflecting the glory of the Lord. And so whatever our stories are in this room, I'll just tell you, anything you let the love of God touch can be healed. Anything you invite the presence of God into can start to reflect him. And then there's practical things you can start to 
demonstrate, and verbalize, and articulate to the people around you because your relationship with God is growing. It's not perfect, but it's growing. Amen? Now, he, is he perfect in you? Yes. Christ is perfect in you. That means everything that's broken, you go to him and you receive his instruction from. Amen? So, Father, I just thank you for everyone in this room, for those watching by live stream and archive. Lord, we just thank you that you love us and that true relationship and healing and growth for anything that's going on or has gone on within our lives is found in our relationship with you. So Father, we just thank you that you teach us again to how to have deep relationship with you so that Lord, it's reflected in the relationships around us and especially in a deep destiny and the purpose of God on our lives. So Father, I just thank you that out of the health of knowing you, it's gonna to touch all of our other relationships. And so Father, we give them to you. We truly allow you to heal our hearts our minds, our interactions, and our hope for the future. Mm. So Father, for whether we're single or married today, Lord, I just thank you for your word and your principles. And Lord, with the challenge that I gave today, help us find different people that we can praise, genuine see and declare just the beauty of how you made them so that their hearts and connection, Lord Father God, we can continue to build friendships, relationships around us to introduce them and lead them to your kingdom. We love you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, I just want to invite up our prayer ministers right now as well. So those of you on campus, we have some amazing prayer ministers here ready to pray with you. Anything you'd like to receive prayer for, something you've heard today that's ministered to you, or it's just Monday and you just need some prayer on a Monday. <laughs> it's Monday. Um, we need prayer. Every amen. And so, and then also for our live stream audience, I want to let you know, we have an amazing prayer ministry. We've got prayer ministers that are excited and ready to pray with you. You can call our prayer line at 719-635-1111. Uh, but we just thank you so much for joining us. And please feel free to check out our archives, um, awmi.net forward slash relationship so that you can rewatch this teaching and listen to any of our other teachings that we have on there as well. But you guys are blessed and you have a wonderful rest of your week. Amen. amen. God bless you guys. Woohoo!